and we are live. Excellent. So, welcome everybody. Let's just give a minute or so for some more attendees to join. Um, but for those of you that were patiently waiting, thank you very much. Uh, really excited for this one today. But as I say, let's give um, a couple of seconds here and we will get kicked off with today's session. Okay, great. See lots of people coming in. Excellent. Some new faces, some existing, some friends. Love it. Great to see it. Okay, guys, thank you very much for joining us and welcome to our video series, The Ledge. This is our video webinar series where we dive into all things Web3. Last time we had a great session on tokenization of real world assets with Alejandro from DeFactor. Anybody who missed that can catch it on demand. And that's very much the way we'll do this. Anybody who can't join us live, we'll make sure to host them on the Zizen website for anybody who'd like to catch up. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna to introduce today's episode. And we do have a special one. We'll be speaking with our friends and partners at the EOS Network Foundation. And today we're gonna to be talking about the new EOS EVM. Um, I am very excited for this one. I've been a huge supporter of EOS since launch. I was speaking with Matthias before this. Unfortunately, I had a lot more hair as I got involved <laughs> in EOS. That seems to be what happens in this, uh, <laughs> in this world. We could spend hours talking about the history of, of EOS and, and how we got here, but despite all of that, I've always believed in the capability of the technology formerly known as EOSIO, now known as Antelope. So I entered the community more of a, a kind of commercially focused person. I was always interested in the potential dApps and tools that could be launched on, on EOS. And that's what kind of got me to can my real job and go into this wonderful world full time. So that was about five years ago now. And although since then, like Antelope technology has always been solid. There was one thing that was missing um, and that was an EOS EVM to allow developers and teams to solve some of the cost and scalability issues that can exist on ETH. So to introduce the ENF, ENF or ES Network Foundation, they're now the lead developer and driving force behind the ecosystem. And it is super refreshing to see some activity and forward momentum in the community. We at Zizen, we were proud to partner with the ENF during the roadshow last year. Nathan, I, and some of the other team went around to some of the major events, introducing the ENF, talking about some of the uh, major developments that were coming. And I think one of the key things that people were asking about was the EVM. So I am really excited to talk about that today. So with that said, I do want to shut up and introduce my <laughs> We have Nathan James and Matthias Romeo. Nathan is the head of developer relations and Matthias is a software engineer for ENF. Both of these guys are serious EOS OGs. They've got a wealth of experience and I'd like to start by giving the guys an opportunity to introduce themselves. So Nathan, let's start with you. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be able to be here today and talk about the EVM. For those that don't know, uh, my name is Nathan James. I've been with the EOS Network Foundation for about a year now, uh, but I've been with the EOS Network since before it launched. Uh, I guess it's five years ago now. Uh, a lifetime ago, I created Scatter, which was the first wallet for EOS that helped launch the chain uh, and served the community for many years after. I also spent the last couple of years uh, before joining the ENF doing protocol work with a blockchain gaming platform called Ultra, which is also based on Antelope. Uh, and I've been a developer for over a decade and a half, working with dozens of companies, creating just incredible products. Uh, that's me. Yes. Thanks, Nathan. Well, um, for those that don't doesn't know me, my name is Matias Romeo. I'm originally joined the EOS ecosystem, uh, working for the EOS Argentina block producer. And as, um, a couple of months ago, I joined the ENF formally as a software engineer, particularly working on the uh, EVM compatibility layer. Uh, well, my, my history of crypto is I started like, like everyone in Bitcoin. I, I'm from Argentina, so Bitcoin has real value here because we have been through so many economic experiments over the years. So basically Bitcoin 
catch up really fast here. And in one of the conferences, a friend of mine told me, hey, you should look at pictures. It has some interesting stuff like stable coins. And, and I said, well, I, I would start looking into that. And I fall into, <laughs> into that <laughs> rabbit hole. And from there, I started working on pictures, <clears throat> then Steam, and finally EOS. I was pretty, very excited to have a general proposed platform based on depots. So I, um, I asked at the moment Dan Larimer that I wanted to participate in the development, and I worked one year in the development of EOS at the beginning uh, for Block One, and that's my short story. No, oh, excellent. Thank you very much, guys. I, I really appreciate it. And I guess to give. Um... Well, first, I do want to introduce, we have some polls that we're going to run throughout this. So the first of the polls is open, and we do just want to know what's your current level of experience with the EOS network. Um, seems we're getting some great interactions already, and most, it seems to say, have some experience with EOS. So there's not a lot saying that they're an expert, not a lot saying that they're completely new. So that's that's good. And we do encourage some of this interaction. It really helps us a lot. So if you guys check out the polls there and, and fill in, that would be that would be amazing. So I guess before diving in, I mentioned earlier, you know, EOS network, it's layer one blockchain, super fast transaction speeds, fast finality. But we're not here to talk about the EOS network per se. If you guys would like to know more about the network and its features, I suggest you check out the ENF website. So that's www.eosnetwork.com. And I have to say, the team has been doing a great job on updating documentation, being really transparent on the developments and the updates. So please do check that out. But today, it's all about the EVM. What is it? How it works? Why it's good for the community and the, the ecosystem as a whole? So look, let's start with you, and then maybe... Let's zoom out a little bit and even not even just the EOS EVM, but what is an EVM? Why is having one on EOS a good thing? Um, okay, I guess there's two questions there. Uh, yes. uh, a virtual machine, so the second part of EVM, virtual machine is just a sandbox runtime environment that executes code. Uh, in the case of blockchain, that code would be a smart contract. The EVM or the Ethereum virtual machine is specifically crafted sandbox that follows the Ethereum specifications. Um, so if you look at most of the top chains, they're either EVM chains, meaning they're specifically created around the EVM uh, specification, or they support EVM development. Um, because of that, most developers in the wider Web3 ecosystem are EVM developers. They know Solidity, they use Hard Hat or Truffle or Foundry, uh, mm -hmm. huge amount of other tools which are available for EVM development. Um, and now they can use those tools they already know and are maintained by dozens of decentralized teams to build on EOS. Um, on top of that, there are also hundreds of already built applications which can now simply port over their applications to EOS EVM to take advantage of our significantly increased speeds and lower costs. Awesome, awesome. So, and I mean, of course, Ethereum has such a, a rich developer ecosystem, the tooling that you mentioned as well. So. I guess, trying to reduce or remove any barriers or additional learnings for developers. They don't have to learn C++ if they don't know it. That's huge, right? That's huge for potential adoption. And as you said, for being able to port over existing projects, right? So that's, oh, that's awesome. We do have a kind of a diagram detailing how the EVM works. So I'm just going to open that up now. And, and, you know, if you guys could talk me through it or, or talk us through what are we seeing here on screen? Sure. Um, so I guess let's let's start from the top. Uh, we wanted to achieve like EVM compatibility uh, on EOS. So there are a few components to this architecture. Uh, if we start at the user, when a user interacts with the EOS EVM by sending transactions through a wallet like MetaMask, for instance, uh, they interact with a component called the transaction miner. Uh, and what this is, is basically it takes a Ethereum formatted transaction and wraps it in an EOS transaction, which can then be sent to an, a standard EOS node. Uh, and we, we require this because you can't send Ethereum transactions to a standard EOS node, right? Um, the account that runs that transaction, uh, the miner effectively spends some EOS resources, so CPU and net, which in a way are similar to the gas fees that are spent mm -hmm. on the EVM side. Uh, and in order to relay that transaction, so they take a percentage of the gas fees for that transaction on the EVM side in order to uh, re-up themselves for what they spent. I think right now it's it's 10%, um, and I know there's discussions of potentially increasing that in the future. 
And we'll talk about what the other 90% is in a second. Um, so from the EOS node, uh, the next component is the EOS contract, which lives within the EOS network. So the Ethereum virtual machine that we spoke of before runs inside the EOS virtual machine. And you can think of this kind of like a Super Nintendo emulator running on the Nintendo Switch. Uh, we're able to run the EVM compatible smart contracts by emulating that environment in which they run naturally. Uh, this means they're also using EOS native resources like RAM for the storage of the EVM state, mm -hmm. uh, which is which is where the rest of the fees for the transactions on EVM go to automatically purchase that RAM on the native side. Um, but once those transactions are included in blocks, they're still EOS transactions around it, right? So we have to take that information and wrap it into something which is useful for EVM tooling, uh, which is the next part of the stack, the EOS EVM node and RPC. Uh, this component takes the EOS formatted information, transforms it into EVM formatted information. It then exposes all the routes that EVM tooling expect to exist, uh, which enables full compatibility with all existing EVM software that lets you uh, specify custom endpoints at least. Uh, so things like hard hat, truffle, remix, metamask, uh, all of et cetera, all work out of the box with the EOS EVM and smart contracts also do not need any special modifications to work with the EOS EVM. Uh, I guess the final piece of this is probably the tokenomics, sure. uh, where tokenomics of the EOS EVM are quite simple. The base token of the EOS EVM is also just uh, EOS. So it's the same as the native network. There was no new token created or minted specifically for the EVM. And in order to get EOS on the EVM, you have to bridge it over through a native, uh, from the native network using the on-chain trustless bridge, uh, which is a contract that's also, uh, that's the contract deployed on the EOS network. Um, and it simply forwards your EOS to an EVM address that you specify. So there are no third party oracles required or centralized services that you typically see on other chains that have that kind of bridge. Um, this also means that any exchange that supports withdrawing tokens to EOS native also, uh, well, at least as long as they don't have a contract on it, also supports withdrawing <laughs> EOS EVM tokens directly on an Ethereum address now. Mm -hmm. So exchanges don't have to do any additional integrations. Uh, they don't have to do anything to support withdrawals directly to your new EOS EVM address on, on EOS. Uh, so all exchanges that basically supported EOS now also support the EVM as well. There are, of course, however, fees included, uh, incurred with the bridge that you need to cover the gas cost of the transactions because there's just gas on the EVM side. Mm -hmm. So that's taken out of the, the money that you transfer through the bridge. Okay. Okay. Understood. Understood. Matthias, do you have anything to add here? on, on the Yes. No, but Nathan was really clear, but yes, yes maybe it's just to add some, some uh, small additions. Well, the things that uh, in the diagram there, we, you, you see that there's an EVM contract, right? And, and it's important to mention that the EVM execution layer is a standard EOS contract, right? And that was a decision made at the beginning where we had two options. One was to um, implement the EVM inside the EOS node, but that will require us for all the network to operate the nodes, even, even though that EOS has a, um, a way to, to do that transparently, uh, we decided to go the route of having the EVM as a standard EOS contract, right? Um, so that's one of the things uh, that the EVM runs inside a standard EOS contract, meaning that any improvement in the layer one EOS that will make an impact also in the EVM contract performance. So whenever we have, uh, there's a roadmap for uh, instant finality for transactions. So by the time the underlying uh, layer has that, that will also impact the EVM transactions. And on the other hand, the, the EOS EVM node and RPC, well, that's also an important piece because you can just have the execution layer, right? The EVM contract, but as Nathan was saying, there's a lot of ecosystem tooling and things around that wants to speak a standard uh, API specification, which is the web tree, which is a standard set of um, uh, methods that tooling are expecting. So basically we leverage the, the the development of one native Ethereum node, which is Silkworm. And, and we took that and we basically feed that node with all the information that has been processed by the EVM contract. And, and that gives us uh, the compatibility layer, the execution layer, which is the EVM contract, and also the API compatibility, uh, uh, giving the, the developers like a transparent uh, interaction with the chain uh, 
thinking that they are interacting with the standard EVM chain. <clears throat> Okay, excellent. Thank you, guys. I, I really appreciate the, the description. And Nathan, I, I really like that analogy of like the video game emulator. It was described really well. I think Zach on, on everything EOS described it also like that. And it's a yeah. That's yeah I think I think Zach said something like PS Five. I'm more inclined to think like it's a PS Five emulating uh, <laughs> a Game Boy Advance. But well, uh, <laughs> that, beside the joke. The, the EVM is now a standard. It's the, the way that that most solid most developers on on, on Web three uh, is what they 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 write into, right? So, to. yeah. yeah, it's 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 a new standard, and I think it it was a great idea for the network EOS Network Foundation to support this this kind of uh, compatibility layer. Uh, besides the besides the inefficiency, I, I know that we can talk about. The, the, the EVM, the way it was assigned, uh, compared to the runtime that we have natively on 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 EOS, there are pretty big differences. But the EVM is is the standard one. There's a lot of developers. There's a lot of companies doing uh, audits on smart contracts. There's a lot of tooling. So that makes all the 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 community that that gives value to all the the community. No, very well said. And I, I have to echo that from a Zizon point of view. We've been speaking with teams and companies for the past four or five years. And a lot of the times it's a question we get asked straight up is, is it EVM compatible? And that sometimes has been a blocker when we were getting people trying to port some of their games or some of their applications over to EOS. And, and hopefully now uh, with EVM, that that's no longer the case. And and I think you said it really well, Matthias, like the the... ENF being the driving force behind a lot of this. I spoke to Nathan on this last week, and I think you know it's about filling the gaps that were there. There were so many things that we could see of like, if we only had this, then we could do that, right? So right. thankfully, ENF has been, and I think it started with all of the, the blue papers, right? Getting a lot of the community thinking about some of these gaps, how they might be filled um, mm -hmm. from there. You know, rolled into to projects which we can see come to life now, which is fantastic. Um, so I know you you did mention the tokenomics and how the transactions work. We we can dive into that a little bit later. I just question that came to my mind. Let's say I'm a Solidity developer and I don't have you know a lot of knowledge on how resources are allocated or managed on EOS. Is that abstracted away for the Solidity developer, or do they need to know that? Uh, no, I thought that Nathan was. Uh, yeah. No, no, that, but... you take it. I think we no, both okay. know the answer for this. Is no yeah, way. yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's abstracted away. They, okay, you, great. You just think in terms of gas price and 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 gas execution and gas used. So yes, it's exactly the same uh, way that I used to interact with an EBM chain. And in fact, we we the the, the EBM version that it's deployed right now is the, uh, the London fork. So you should expect the exact same gas usage for a contract that is running on any other DBM uh, on another platform than uh, the one that you have on EOS EVM. So yes, that's a really interesting point because uh, I'm pretty ba big fan of EOS like because I, I, I like the platform, I like the technology, but that doesn't mean that it's kind of complicated when you, uh, yes, we, we, you want to like interact in some high level way. So. Uh, having to think about the resources of RAM and NET and CPU sometimes makes your life a little bit difficult. Mm -hmm. Besides the thing that you need to write in C++ or any other language that can transfer to WASM. If there's some understatements there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so having a way to, to uh, uh, unify all the resource consumption under the, the, the gas usage for me is it's, yeah, it's pretty much simple. Oh, excellent. That, that's exactly the way to go. Because again, that, that's been, I'm, I'm trying to just think through the years, all of the friction points or questions which I had been gotten, a lot of a lot of this can be, as you said very well, abstracted away or simplified. So somebody who understands the development in a certain way and a certain technology with a certain set of tools, they can still do that. And, and that's what it's all about, right? Right. And, 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 and also take into account that the EOS has a really great throughput really uh, great performance and also has been working like 
without interruption of service for many years, mm -hmm. uh, having this compatibility layer on top that makes life simple for developers and also for projects to move in a, a, a easy way to, to this new platform. Uh, I think that it's a good combination. No doubt. Yes. Thank you very much for that, guys. And again, just directing the audience, we do have some polls running uh, at the moment. So there's a, an introduction poll where we'd like to know your current level of experience with EOS. But I've also opened another question, which is how likely are you to adopt EVM for, for some of your dApps if you are indeed a, a developer or a builder? And, and it's great. We've got 40% of the, the responders are saying that they're, they're very likely. Um, that's now gone up to 50% as, as I've been talking. Which is great. And in terms of the, the level of experience, it seems we've got about 60% of people saying that they have some experience with EOS. And we've got 26% saying that they're completely new to, to EOS. So again, if you missed me saying at the beginning, please check out some of the, the documentation that the ENF has been working on. That will certainly bring you up to speed, at, you know, plus the GitHub, etc. if you'd like to catch up on what's been built there. Um, so I do really appreciate you guys giving us this this breakdown really, really clear. I guess I do want to dive a little bit more into well, the development process of the EVM and how did we get to this point, I guess. Um, so let's dive into that. Well, um, it, uh, as you said before, it was it all started with the blue papers that mm -hmm. were put forward by the ENF. And by that time, uh, we were invited to work on a blue paper related to wallets. And, and we said that uh, we don't see that we can provide much value there, but we wanted to focus on the on the EVM compatibility layer. And that was taken by the NF and make a specific group, a working group uh, to, to work towards that idea uh, that was having a compatibility, EVM compatibility layer on top of EOS. Uh, well, uh, it's been a long, a long journey <laughs> because we went back and forward in some, uh, in some way. At the beginning, we were thinking about having a separate token instead of using the native EOS token. Thinking in terms of um, funding the, the future development and improvements of the EVM. Uh, but uh, at some point in, in, in the future, we decided to go back and and use the the native EOS token, which basically uh, for me was a the right decision to make because also, that also impacts on the demand of the EOS token and the usage of the EOS network. Uh, so for me, it was a, a, the, right, the right decision to, to take. Uh, I don't know if Nathan wants to add something there. Sure. Um, yeah, the, I mean, the development, I think, of the EVM predated me coming into uh, the ENF. So it's it's been in, in the process for a while and it was like a huge undertaking by a bunch of contributors from across the ecosystem. Um, it's also open source now, uh, so anyone can browse the history of that GitHub uh, repository, which is really nice. Um, the development process is actually also open source. Uh, and from It's on GitHub, and I think we do everything from ticket, ticketing to uh, project management open for that project as well, as we do for most other projects. Um, there's, uh, from my understanding, there's going to be a public roadmap published soon, which will also provide a bit of clarity on what's coming down the pipeline in the future uh, in terms of feature and functionalities. Um, I guess it's probably also important to note that EOS is our only target. So though this is open source and any other chain can adopt it and get the benefits of uh, the wonderful work that, that we're doing on this, we aren't offering any SLAs or support to any chain that does adopt it. So we are focusing, we, the ENF, are focusing entirely on EOS and on EOS. Okay. Oh, thanks for that. That was a, a follow-up question was about the, the support and maintenance going forward. And I guess, as you say, we've got a roadmap coming, which please, everybody, keep your eye out for that. And also great to hear that it is open source. So anybody's able to go check the histories, fork it, play with it. You know, it's a lot of yeah, these initiatives. And if you have any bugs, let me know. Yes, please. <laughs> there again, guys. Go try to break things. Move fast and break things. <laughs> I mean, that, that's really it's it's an important thing that you're touching on because web. So you look at web two organizations and they're very slow and rigid and everything has to go through like a thousand internal iterations before it's brought out to the public. Yes, uh, and 
in Web3, we try not to do that. We try to get something out as quickly as possible to the public so that we can iterate on the feedback of our communities because we are driven by these huge, massive communities who care about the products that we're creating. Uh, and I think it's a much better way to drive an ecosystem than trying to make this own bubble in our head and then yep. only release it when it's super ready to pop. Correct. Uh, you're absolutely right. With that. Excellent. I mean, and so moving on, this is kind of the, as I mentioned earlier on, this is where I get excited. I'm, I'm, I'm not a techie. I'm a commercial guy. I'm an ideas guy. I like to think about real world use cases and, and kind of potential benefits. So if, if we were talking about real world use cases or, or ideal project types that, that should come in and utilize this, what are your guys' take on that? Uh, let's start with you, Matthias. Well, I have the perspective most of the developers, so I will say that any project that is looking for a reliable layer one, also compatible with with, with the EVM, can benefit from from this platform. But thinking in terms of what EOS, uh, the value proposition of EOS, um, which is speed, reliability, you 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 get by that a really cheap transaction. Uh, uh, price. So I would say that maybe some non-financial applications or or applications that um, that the transaction cost should be low because it maybe will jeopardize their business model can benefit from having a, a not only a, 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 a an EVM that is cheap to say something but also is kind of predictable in mm -hmm. a way that how the price will move along the time based on the on the congestion of the network uh, and that's also a differentiation for a differentiation for me okay excellent nathan um i I've, i echo that entirely i think that uh it's it's a funny question to ask developers right because <laughs> they're like oh well anything that you could potentially do on blockchain you can now do on this right uh, but I, I do think that because of the speed uh well taking the speed specifically and the speed of EOS EVM specifically, uh, there are a couple other possibilities which are now possible on EOS that aren't necessarily possible on others. So I like, here's the two things I, I like most. I like social media and I like games in, in terms of like, you know, blockchain applications. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that there's a couple of genres of games that you can now do on EOS that you can't necessarily do on other chains. Uh, so even something as simple as an RPG where you can put every hit of a mob onto the chain, that's actually possible now, whereas it would be incredibly expensive on some other chains, uh, obtusely slow on, on most of them. Uh, so things like real-time strategy, uh, I guess you might even be able to get away with some really rudimentary Doom-style networking because that stuff has uh, P2P, uh, P2P characteristics which would match our specific speeds. Um, so gaming is, of course, just one example, but that same concept trickles over to other areas like digital assets, DeFi, social, and everything in between that. We're opening the doors for new styles of applications to be created on blockchains, which I think is really important for the progress of the space as a whole. No, oh, excellent. No doubt. I mean, when, I, when typing up this question, certainly gaming was one of the first ones that came to mind. We had from, from a Zizen perspective, been working with a lot of studios, games that had run into either cost or scalability issues or even things that it was a game that maybe had, let's say, a million users in the Web2 world. And they were really concerned about how can they actually mirror that without having to spend whatever, hundreds of thousands of dollars in in fees or, or having it be congested or clunky. So certainly with right. gaming, but I think if I can... Also, I'm involved with some some DeFi projects. If I can put that hat on there now, I'm thinking for you know real world asset tokenization, things like things that are high throughput, right? Invoices, things that move a lot and very quickly. You know, with asset classes like gold, where you you don't need a lot of transactions, maybe not necessarily, but something that's really high throughput, trade finance or invoice financing, you certainly need that speed. Um, so that when yeah. I was thinking about this, I, certainly it's, it's use cases like that. And I would invite, you know, DeFi protocols, games to come test this out. Let's see what's possible. Um, you know, I mean, soon with instant finality happening in comparison to other chains, you'll be, you'll have finality on your transaction in EOS before you have one confirmation on some of these other chains. Mm -hmm. So there's a big difference there in terms of DeFi uh, and 
what you can actually do and how fast you can get in and out of markets. Yes, yeah. And I guess just sticking with performance, it kind of leads me into the next question. And that's, I guess, benchmarking or performance features in, in comparison. So uh, I'm assuming you guys have run some tests. I've seen some stuff out there. How are the numbers looking? Or talk to us a little about that. I guess, I sadly, I, I don't think I threw you over the graph, which had um, which had this stuff. It would have made a good uh, little yeah, graphic for the yeah. presentation. Um, but basically, so we ran some tests which measured the speed of swaps per second, which is the same methodology as a company called Dragonfly Research did for a variety of other chains. Uh, it's actually quite uh, known and standard. Um, and that paints the swaps per second metric paints a better picture of reality than just token transfers, which are often the most performant transactions on a network, but not necessarily the most uh, frequently done. Um, so the results of that was the EOS EVM hit 814 swaps per second, whereas the closest competitor, which was Solana, came in at 273. Mm. Um, Polygon was at 47, AVAX at 31, and I think Ethereum was at, at 9. Uh, so yeah. this provided us data to like back up the claims that this is, if not uh, one of the most performant EOS e or EVM in existence. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as far as um, features goes, we're still pretty early, but we do have complete EVM compatibility, which mm -hmm. isn't true from my understanding of all other EVMs, at least the ones that I play with, they do have some small differences. Um, we are missing some elements like WebSocket and GraphQL, uh, which will open the door to many more applications being able to be migrated over to the EOS EVM. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have some ways to open those doors in the near future. Uh, there are also other peripherals as well, which we were identifying based on developer and user feedback. Uh, and we're taking stock of that, with what we lack to make sure that we provide better experiences than other EVMs, mm -hmm. or at least on par with, if not better. Um, it's something we do daily. So if you're in one of the EOS chats talking about the EVM and we see uh, something that is obviously missing, be sure that we see you and we're cataloging that into our backlogs. Okay, nice. And I guess on that, if anybody did want to join those chats, where would they find the chats for the EOS EVM? So if you go to our docs, uh, docs.eosnetwork.com, uh, docs.eosnetwork.com, mm -hmm. then there's a helpful links place there, which has all of the links that you need to all of the various Telegram groups. Um, most of them are EOS groups. We're trying to really keep everything inside of EOS groups instead of mm -hmm. having separate groups for each and every different project. Um, so if you join any of those, then we're, we're going to see you. Raise yeah. your hand and we'll say hi. And yeah, also I'll give everybody a a call to action to join one of the, the weekly fireside chats as well, which which ENF runs. And that, that always gives a good insight into what's happening, plus the Discord channels as well too. So so be sure to do that. But on the performance, that, that's really impressive, Nathan. So if I can, quick math, it's almost 100, time, 100 times quicker in terms of swaps per second than Ethereum and almost three times faster than Solana, right? So... If okay. looking at it that way, yeah, that, that's, again, encourage anybody to go in, take a look. You know, this is also on, on Jungle, right? So people can go in and, and test on their Jungle testnet. Perfect. Right. right. Excellent. Fantastic. And we did touch on this a little bit earlier, but I suppose just, just to deep dive a little bit into, into it more. So the, the tr transactions or the, or the gas is going to be paid with the native EOS token, right? And I, I did... I want to ask this, so there's some obvious implications to the community and the project, but I wanted to just touch on that decision to not have a, a native token or a new token for that, but instead to use EOS. Well, uh, as I was mentioning before, at the at the beginning of the project, the, 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 the idea that we had was to use the EOS token, the mm -hmm. native EOS token for, to, to pay for transactions. Then we were playing around the idea of having like multiple tokens to 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 use as as the gas token but we we run to a limitation of wallets which uh, they only use the native token of the platform so mm -hmm. we we have to decide which way to go the idea to use a separate token uh, uh, look interesting at the beginning because it was also a way to uh, maybe raise some funds to support the future development of the platform, mm -hmm. uh, but at the end of the time, we, we, the, the, the ENF uh, decided to go the the native EOS route, and and well, that 
for me is again it's it's the right decision. I'm 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 it's like um uh, yes it's the right decision for me because it will make the the demand for the EOS token. Like you can think of the EVM the EVM platform as the new DAP on top of EOS, right? Mm -hmm. A popular a popular DAP. So uh, uh, every traffic that you get into that uh, in, into that execution environment will demand EOS. So that will 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 redound in, in some demand some extra demand for it. and also you have the possibility uh, the ENF is running a miner so that you have the possibility to burn some tokens right the, the the ones that you have been collecting as um, as the fees so it opens up a lot of possibilities and I think that it's it's for me that I, I'm happy to have the DTBS token as the as a transaction token. They're very much the same. I think yeah. that um from the EOS native side, it's been a long time since there's been any added utility to the EOS token. Uh, I think, I guess, since since Rex, if you can even call that added, it's more staking than anything. Um, but it's now not only being able to be used to pay the gas fees on EVM, which is an added utility, but it's also being used to purchase RAM through the contract on the native side, which is another added utility. And then yes. on top of that, it's uh, it's a minor reward, right? So we've also opened up uh, not only new utilities, but new earning mechanisms. Uh, so there's there's a couple different ways to look at that. Um, so like Matias said, we're also running a miner and that, that burn is kind of important to us as well because many other chains in the industry have introduced deflationary models. And we've seen this, you know, people really care about this. It's not just for, for no good reason that, that chains are doing this. Um, and it's not for no good reason that they're actually doing this. There's there's inflation in, in most chains, so we have to yes. offset, offset that somehow. Yeah, and for exactly. us, it's specifically important because we, the ANF, get paid off of the inflation, and we would like to offset ourselves. Yes. Um, so that's also important to us. No, that's a good um, point. And I mean, when we were doing the, the roadshow last year, we were in, in Dubai at Web Summit, et cetera, and at this point, there was still talk of having that second token or new token. And right. To be honest, it did cause a little bit of confusion like when we were talking to some potential members of the community or people who knew EOS from, from the early days. Everybody was asking, well, why not just use EOS? Don't and you know we like to over-engineer stuff here at EOS? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we need all the utility we can get, right? And having offset and new deflationary mechanisms would, would really help. So now I'm, right. I'm, I'm all in favor of this. So excellent. Again, thank you for. I, I think there is one last. Uh, there's one last part there. So uh, the project itself. How does this like impact the the project? What are the implications sure. of that? So for the project, um, there's a lot of benefits to this decision, right? So the EOS token is on basically every exchange in existence, right? So you we don't have to worry about the network uh, and the projects. Uh, having to wait for that new EVM token to be on some exchange so there's some liquidity and the ability for people to purchase into it. It's also on other things like, uh, what are they called? Um, MoonPay. Uh, so you can instantly buy the EOS EVM token with like a credit card. So we have immediate on, on ramp mm. tooling. Uh, and I think that's really important for these projects to be able to migrate over and instantly have availability for their for their applications in terms of gas fees and uh, just onboarding of users. Yes. Oh, well said. Well said. I really appreciate it, guys. As I said, we I know we've touched on it a couple of times, but it's nice to be able to dive into it a little bit. And and another thing that we mentioned a couple of times, which is coming soon, but that's that instant finality. And and I did want to talk about the the impact of that. Or what? How will that impact the EVM? Uh, Matthias, I think you were you were touching on it a little bit earlier on. Yes, well, uh, as we were saying before, uh, any improvement on the base layer of EOS that will impact the EVM mm -hmm. uh, directly. So, because as when Nathan was explaining how uh, how the transaction flow works, uh, every EVM transaction is wrapped around an EOS transaction. So basically you end up running an EOS transaction that execute on the EVM smart contract. Um, so by the time you, you will get um, instant finality, you will get instant EVM finality, instant mm -hmm. EVM transaction finality. So that's a really good value proposition. Even if EOS has, like, we can say like one second finality, probabilistic, probabilistic finality, because by the time it gets into a block, the probability that it gets fork or or that you need to, to, to resend the transaction is pretty low uh, but you will get 
that level of certainty by protocol. So uh, yes, it's it's very um, very very important to 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 have that. And I I am reading the slide that it said block time and its impact, right? And and maybe this is something to to touch uh, mm -hmm. on too because. <laughs> What's so nice 500 so millisecond, one millisecond. <laughs> yeah, that's how I read it too. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. It, it's been a lot of noise that we weren't we weren't aware. Like the, the, some some discussions that uh, for me it was a non-issue, but maybe we can when we can explain that. Um, <clears throat> well, as we we said, the EBM is a, a contract inside EOS. So in, in EOS happens to have. Uh, 0 0.500 millisecond blocks, right? Mm -hmm. So at the very beginning of the of the design decisions on the EBM, we were thinking about okay, maybe we can have a ratio between um, x amount of EOS blocks are one EBM block. So in the early testing, we were doing like 10 blocks on EOS, one block on EBM. So basically, we were having five seconds, uh, five seconds EBM blocks. Uh, but then we started to Depart from that from that idea of having a, a, a specific relationship between the amount of EOS block number related to the EBM block number, and and we started thinking about time, right? So we uh, because I don't I I'm not saying that this will happen in the future, but if for some reason uh, the EOS network decides to go lower 500 milliseconds, like 250, uh, well, that will increase the frequency of the EVM if we have a, that strict, uh, that uh, constant relationship between blocks. So we depart from that and said, okay, let's trust, let's trust time. And by the time we decide to go for for time, well, we have the option since the underlying layer has subsequent uh, blocks, mm -hmm. we can go that way also and have. Uh, subsequent blocks on the EVM, but the thing is that we prioritize uh, the compatibility, right? To not deviate much from the standard. And if you look at the resolution that EVM has for the block for the block time is time is seconds. So the amount of benefit that you get from going subsecond is not that much because you have all the throughput of the network, like in that one second EVM block, you have all the throughput of the two blocks. On the EBM on the EOS side, so you are not losing any throughput. So you will say, okay, but the the latency uh, is increasing because by the time you make a state a change in the state of the EBM, you will have to wait 500 more milliseconds. Okay, that's not an issue. That's not an issue with all the tools that you have around that have polling intervals that are pretty much higher frequencies. So <laughs> the thing is that. Um, uh, we prioritize not to deviate from the standard, and the things that we are missing are not an issue mm -hmm. at all. Right. I think it's even so. I I like front end. That's my that's my like toolkit, right? I, I'm full stack developer, but I prefer front end. Mm -hmm. And I heard this initially, and I was like, "The heck does this matter?" Because. <laughs> As, as a front end, okay, let's let's take this back. 20 years ago, the internet was slow. So the expectation of people was that you click a button and nothing happens for a while. Yeah. Right. But that's not true anymore because the internet is fast. So we, the developers, have accustomed ourselves to our end users, uh, uh, like what they expect, their expectations. And the second that you click a button, if there is a response that's over 50 milliseconds, you're adding a loader or a spinner or something to it because you want people to... Uh, be able to understand that feedback. Yes. Um, so what's the actual difference here? There's 500 milliseconds, which network time. So the return trip time of that is probably like 700 milliseconds. Um, and then you have 1,000 milliseconds, which will turn that into 1,200 milliseconds. So the difference between 700 milliseconds and 1,200 milliseconds, you're not going to notice that. You'd notice if it was like the difference between 50 milliseconds and 300 milliseconds, because mm -hmm. that's yeah. seemingly a long time for when you click the button. But you're already going to have a spinner. Um, so from from a like front end development perspective, okay, let's now now that we know that, let's put that aside. If you're doing any of that stuff, you're probably a bad front end developer anyway. Because what you really want to do is you want to unblock the user instantly. You go, it's like AWS. Right. If I go and provision a server for myself, I don't sit around there for five minutes waiting for my server to be provisioned. 
it says, okay, well, go do something else. We're going to provision your server. And when it's ready, we'll let you know. Yes. And that's that's really the best kind of flow for any kind of Web3 application. That's what we should be leaning on is that fire and forget and then come back with a resolution later. If it fails, you still have that transaction ready to reprocess. You have all of the information required for it. So it's not like you're losing state. You just have to repush that. Mm -hmm. No, understood. And, and that's well said. I also think about things from that front end user experience type. I mean, and that's, that's really what I think about is the, the value to the user. And if it's not, you know, seconds or many right. seconds, they have to wait. Look, but imagine this from like a smart contract developer's perspective. So they, they give zero, I, I, can I say this on a webinar? It says television, they give zero fucks <laughs> about uh, latency, right? Like right. zero, literally zero. It doesn't matter to them. Um, but what they give a lot of fucks about is if there's an incompatibility with something they expect. So mm. if the block cadence is different than the Ethereum specifications block cadence, that messes with their contracts. It potentially messes with their tooling. Uh, and I think that's really the decision, th the best part about the decision that was made that it's never going to interfere with any of that stuff. Sure. Mm -hmm. No, excellent. Excellent. That, that's... Thank you. Thank you very much for touching on that. I do see we have a, a lot of interactions with the polls, which is which is great. They have uh, I have opened up a new question about challenges or perceived challenges from the audience. What do they think will be the, the biggest challenge in, in transitioning their Ethereum dApps to, to EVM? So please get involved in that. It's, it's great to see the interactions coming in. I do have kind of a final kind of a fun type question, but with all of the yes hype around ai tools if you want to call them AI, i know that that's another that's another uh, conversation but the necessity of evm now chat gpt does have a solidity to c plus plus writing capability i i I've heard some crazy statistic like 50 percent of all new code going on to github was written by ai like yeah talk to me a little bit about this crazy world and that's that's a crazy because Imagine, so what's going to happen? It's code learning from bad code, mm. right? So if it's just put up there without a developer, that's, I just want to talk about it because it's yeah, a really please. interesting thing. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like code incest, right? If you have this code, which is only learning from the own, its own code that it's written without a developer actually going through and be like, oh, that's wrong, uh, then it's reiterating on the fact that that was code that it can then learn from and then give back to another developer. And it does, it goes through that cycle again. It like deep learns itself through yes. that code. That's a scary thought that you just brought up. <laughs> so I hope that's not true that 50%, uh, at least it's like- uh, uh, Let me let me try dig out that statistic. It was, uh, when I read it, I was like, that's after blowing my fucking mind. I don't like that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do, however, really like AI. I use. Yes. I was one of the first people to use like um, uh, Copilot, and I still use it every day, daily. I think it's a lovely mm. tool. It help, really helps me speed things up. But of course, it's like using Stack Overflow. I don't just mindlessly copy paste something and like, oh, I, oh. no, correct. So you, 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 you can leave aside the criteria, like for the time being. <laughs> For the timing, but yeah, the timing. Need to, yeah for the timing. But uh, anyway, like stressing the question there, like uh, let's think that you have a perfect mapping between Solidity and C++, and, and it also ports the unit test for the contract, etc. That's only part of the things because you also have some backends and also have some indexers and some. Yes. You have a lot of stuff surrounding the your 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 DAP deployment. So that's only one of the one part of the of of the stack, uh, so we, even if you have a perfect map translation between Solidity to C plus plus, there's a lot of things that you will also will have to translate. And I don't at this point I don't think that maybe I will regret this five years. <laughs> <laughs> but no, at this point, at this point, at right. this point, at this point. <laughs> Right. And yeah. even so, I think the biggest thing that you, the most important thing you said there is the if even if there was a perfect one to one mapping, because there's not, because there's right? not, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you were to like do a hundred contracts, seventy percent, seventy of them, so seventy percent of them would probably have some kind of security vulnerability, because mm. uh, it it can't possibly. Um, how, how does this stuff work? It knows outputs based on previous inputs. Inputs, yes. Right? That, that's that's just how AI works. So you're if you're doing anything novel, basically, 
you have to know okay. what you're doing or you're going to miss right. something and it's it's going to like it's going to be bad it's going to be yeah. bad bro yeah. <laughs> no. and 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 also the translation of them we are talking about language here like from solidity to c++ but then when you translate to solidity from c++ well you will basically try to run a, a dap that was thought to be running on EBM on top of EOS. And maybe the capabilities are not the same. Maybe mm -hmm. you are trying, you, 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 you need something that the EBM platform provides that it doesn't exist on EOS or all the way run also. So it's- uh, Some oracles, some third party composable apps or yeah. Right, right, right. Also, right. Also the interaction between contracts because the, 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 because if you only have the ability to port a contract, but maybe you need a full ecosystem. What happens if your contract is looking for prices on AMMs or other stuff? Mm -hmm. So uh, there's probably uh, another really big thing here, which is just uh, you wouldn't open the door to tooling, right? So if there was no AVM and you were just you know rewriting your your stuff to Solidity uh, to C plus plus from Solidity. You wouldn't be able to use MetaMask. You would then have to rewrite right. your backend, like you said. Right. Uh, you wouldn't be able to use all of Hard Hat and and etc. You'd have yes. to rewrite all that stuff. You might as well just go rewrite your your stuff from scratch if you're doing that. Anyway. And you will lose the audit from the company person, right. Yeah. right? Because they will have to make the audit again on the C plus plus. Come audit my chat GPT code. <laughs> Audit GPT. Oh, that would probably work real well. Yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> now that you that. I'm just I'm I'm frantically trying to go and see what the name of it was, but there is a, a smart contract auditing tool, uh, AI based. Let me see. I can't remember what it was called, but yeah, I'll, I'll figure it out. Um, no, this is it's super interesting to me. I'm sorry, I had to add it in. Like I'm somewhat afraid but also optimistic in what this this whole world means and i know matthias you're saying in five years but the speed that this thing is going oh, i know i know, <laughs> like, you know? I, I i try to be conservative but yes. the, the rate of compounding it's oh uh, absolutely and look we will be actually we're planning to do some some sessions on this going forward as well so just talking about the potential impl implications of ai into web3 and what that, that might mean so we'll yeah, but we'll, we'll get working on that. I, I do appreciate it, guys. As I said, a fun question, but I, I just wanted to get your get your take on it. Um, I did yeah. want to open it up. We, we do have some questions from the audience, which is great. Um, but anybody else that would please uh, reach out in the chat and we'll be sure to uh, to relay them to the guys here. So I do have one here. Apologies, I'm, I'm not probably not going to get your name right. Vibe, Vibe. Apologies, Hendrix. Um, he says, "Will can this EVM also be used for EOS ecosystem blockchains such as Proton?" Um, so, I think I know the answer for this one, but I'll I'll open it up to to you guys. Just Next give minute. it. Just give it. You know it. As what the, as the guys had said earlier on, this is open source, right? So people can take it and build it and, and utilize it from there. But this particular EOS EVM is built and is going to be maintained for the EOS network. Um, but again, it's it's open source code, so you can take it, deploy it, and other chains, for example, at Zizen, we I don't think it would be particularly too hard to deploy it to another chain, would it? No, no at all. I don't believe so at all. And actually, something we're also investigating, we have our, our chain, Europe chain as well, so investigating putting it that, that on there too. So hopefully that answers your question. And we do have another uh, from Ricardo on sec. That's a good question. Yeah, I see that. So Ricardo Pinto asks, doesn't shorter finality have a higher risk of being forked? I remember noticing state of contracts reversing due to micro forks when dealing with many transactions. So I'd love if you guys, your, your, your take on that. Uh, I can, I can take that one. Please. Uh, when, when we are talking about um, transaction finality, that is one of the efforts that the ENF is working on, uh, we are talking about protocol finality, that the transaction can't be reverted. So basically, if the transaction uh, is finalized, uh, it can't be in a fork uh, uh, a later time. So it's final. The, 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 the state modifications that that transaction made remains there in the canonical chain, on mm -hmm. the, in the correct chain. So um, it, would uh, reduce, it would reduce the amount of forks. 
the amount of time of a fork is possible. It will reduce the amount of that the fork is possible, right? Yes, 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 sure, sure. So uh, basically, you want <laughs> uh, when your transaction is final, it's not possible for that transaction to be reverted. It is final by protocol. Mm -hmm. EOS already have that. Like you have the last irreversible block, yes. which means that any transaction that is uh, behind that block uh, is not possible to be reverted. Uh, that finality time is like is more than two minutes for now, but you have two hundred and fifty seconds. And uh, but you have a probabilistic finality that you know that your transaction won't be reverted like ninety nine percent of the time. But uh, what this um, transaction finality wants to do is to have that instant finality, but uh, assured by protocol. So if your transaction is final, it can be forked. If your transaction is final, it can't be forked. Excellent. Thank you for that, Ricardo. I hope that answers your question. You did have a follow-up saying that you think the main challenges will be uh, adapting to the adapting the tooling for back end, so smart contracts and, and testing, and front end, uh, and also having the financial interest to do it because the EOS price hasn't been inviting. Uh, but you do leave a, a nice note here to say the community is the strong point since it's full of this OG energy. Make EOS again. I love it. <laughs> Absolutely love it. Um, so th thank you for that, Ricardo. I really appreciate it. We do have uh, another question here from Bjorn who says, can I control the gas fee on the EOS EVM so the user doesn't pay the gas fee as we can in native C++ EOS contracts? Thanks. Yeah, sure. If you take the EVM code that is open source, as Nathan was saying, um, there's a configuration setting, which is now relies on a table, that you can put whatever gas price you want there. Like if you want to process free transaction, no gas, you can do it. Uh, well, you will be responsible for paying the resource on the for the underlying chain. But yes, of course, you can you can make that number zero. Excellent. Which, which is interesting because the Ethereum network is actually trying to work on something uh, like this, not specifically this, but the account abstraction uh, EIP, which is trying to go a different route for that. So this EVM already has the capability of doing something that is only being worked on on other EVMs, which I think is really interesting. Oh, nice. That's cool. Excellent. So, Bjorn, thank you so much for the question. I hope um, I hope that was answered for you. Uh, we do still have some interactions coming in, which is, which is great. 44% um, of the people have said they're very likely to adopt or use the EOS EVM for, for their dApps, which is awesome. I think that's great. And we did have on, on the challenges, 38% of people were saying that one of their biggest challenges in transitioning would be learning EOS specific development skills. I think what I would say is remember that you don't have to necessarily have a lot of EOS specific development skills. That was a red herring. Why did you put that in there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And that was one of the, the, the driving decisions there for the yes. project that people... Uh, don't need to understand anything about EOS. Yes. They just need a, an, an URL where they have to point their MetaMask or their mm -hmm. development tooling, and that's it. And the address of the block, block explorer and a way to launch their own node. But yes. basically, EOS is transparent for them. Uh, yes, it's abstracted but, away. But a wonderful thing to remember here is that if you're building on EOS EVM, you're still building on EOS. Right. Especially since there's only one token. It, uh, the benefits are included onto the native chain from, right. I guess, is it a sub chain now? I'm not sure. <laughs> like the the L1 inside the L1. Yeah, that, that's what really about that. And, and I think the other 40% is basically people saying they want understanding the differences between EOS EVM and, and other EVM implementations. And what I would say is, again, I'd invite people to come in and, and test, right? Go in, see what you can do, see what you like. Please give feedback on the channels, which Nathan talked about earlier on. And again, as we said, move fast and break things. Let's do it. Right. And also, uh, there's, uh, there's that link that Nathan said that is docs.yosnetwork.com, uh, where under the EVM section, you have the compatibility subsection where mm -hmm. we specifically uh, mark the, the, the difference that we, we, we have. And, and yes, that, that, I would say that's a starting point uh, and I can 
99% assured that besides that, we, we are exactly the same as any other EVM. Okay, that's good to hear. And as I said from, from the beginning, this is something that was badly needed, sorely needed. Now it's here. I hope we can you know, circle back. We at Zizen will certainly be circling back to a lot of projects we spoke to over the years to say, you know, come on down, please try this. As I mentioned, DeFi projects I'm involved with also will be coming in to try to test this. So now this this is really exciting. And I'm yeah, super happy you guys could could join us as we move to some kind of closing remarks. I guess, you know, key takeaways here is guys, as we said, we, we want people on here using it, testing it, providing feedback. That is is so key. Um, I did just want to ask a question. So let's blue sky it here. If you are a developer um, specifically looking to explore the EVM, where, where would you begin? What, what's step one? Uh, Nathan, I think. I'd... Sure. I mean, uh, docs. Docs. I've said a couple of times. Docs. Uh, I'm literally before this, I just finished uh, doing a video tutorial on setting up hard hat. It's okay. four minutes long and it's everything that you need to know in order to get started, which is ridiculous. Um, so if, if here's the wonderful thing about this, there's a plethora, there's just a large amount of educational material for EVM development. And now all of that stuff applies to EOS, which is, it's, it's harder to find a non EVM chain than to find an EVM chain. And we've now joined those ranks. So, all of that educational material that was available for everybody else is now also available for us. So if you want to develop specifically on the EOS network, docs.esnetwork.com, you have all your migration guides, your tooling setup guides, all that stuff. And for all other education, though we will also be putting out a lot of education aimed towards the EVM in the very, very near future, the rest of the internet is now your oyster. Yes, I like to hear because Donna is where people should be building in silos. I think, you know, the, the CEO of the ENF, Eve, he said it quite well. The future is multi-chain, right? And and we have to have these tools available. Of course, we didn't even touch on say things like IBC, but having these things available are just so important for adoption. And if we could, I'm really hoping, start to abstract away a lot of this technical complexity, move it to the back end where it's supposed to live and let's about front end and toolings and solutions that can actually add some value. Can you imagine cross chain IBC from EVM to EVM? Awesome. <laughs> Holy moly. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I really appreciate it, guys. The really great energy. As I said, please check out everything that ENF have been doing. Check out the docs. Please come in and try to test things. If there are any teams that would like some consulting or support, please reach out to Zizen. We've got a, a great team can help you guys get started. But look, as Ricardo said, there's an awesome community there. There are a lot of OGs. Some of them are coming back, which is always great to see. Um, so please, yeah, keep in touch with the developments as they come. I did want to thank you guys so much for joining me. I'm sure this is not going to be the last Ledge video, which will feature some of our friends from ENF. So Nathan, Matthias, thank you very much. Thank you for having thank us. You, thank you to everybody who came. Excellent. Thank you, guys. And we will see you on the next one.